Wow! Check out this incredible old growth forest ecosystem here. Forests like these were the initial economic backbone of our modern society all throughout the Cascadian bioregion from Alaska to BC down through Washington, Oregon, and California with the majority of the cities and towns we live in initially being established as port and mill towns. So without these forests, the society we live in today wouldn't be what it is. Yet over the past few centuries, and especially the past few decades with post-war industrial mechanization of the logging industry, a huge majority of these intact old growth forests all across Turtle Island have been destroyed or modified through logging and development. This results in a lack of biodiversity and reduced ecological function which contributes not only to erosion, landslides, flooding, more extreme wildfires, and a host of other issues, but ecosystems that are much more vulnerable to the impacts of anthropogenic climate change and thus less likely to endure and survive. Now, timber is an incredible resource, providing us with essentials for construction and all sorts of other industries, and we will always have a need for it. There's absolutely no denying that. These industries are also a very large part of our economy, employing and supporting a significant portion of those in our communities across a wide range of different skill sets. Yet with limited intact ecosystems remaining and a growing risk of climate-related impacts to our society at large, we need to find a way to do better. To still get wood for all of its many uses, but without destroying the ecological function of these ecosystems we depend on while considering all of the other values these forests hold. With various regulations and impending changes coming, many of the big corporate players in the industry are resisting this transition at all costs. But what can that change look like? How do we balance our need for job stability and economy with the need to have healthy, functioning, diverse, and resilient ecosystems in this era of climate change? How do we do better not only for all of us here and now, but our children and the future generations that will inherit all that we leave behind? Well, what if I told you that this incredible old growth forest ecosystem I'm in here is actually part of a woodlot that's actively managed for timber? Pretty wild, right? That's exactly right, because I'm at a place called Wildwood, which is a demonstration ecoforest on Vancouver Island that's been operating within this intact, functional, old growth forest ecosystem for over 80 years. And what's going on here may just be the key to the future we also desperately need, not only for jobs and economy, but for ecological function, biodiversity, and so much more. Come on, let's go check it out. Wildwood began in 1938 when a fellow by the name of Merv Wilkinson acquired this land and began to look at how to manage it. Common logging practices at the time emphasized maximizing economic outputs to get the most value from the land, but under the influence of Scandinavian forestry practices that looked at the health of a forest as a whole, Merv was determined to do things differently. Instead of accepting the status quo and doing what everyone else is doing, Merv got creative. He understood that perhaps we didn't know everything we thought we did about these lands and the impacts we were having, so he started asking questions and looked to the forest for answers. The result is a unique, innovative blend of methodology and philosophy that combines aspects of those older Scandinavian forestry practices with indigenous wisdom and learnt experiences in a management style known as ecoforestry. Ecoforestry is more of a stewardship model first and foremost that aims to create a healthy functioning forest ecosystem that in turn provides a healthy abundant source of timber as well as a host of other values. Though the scale here is relatively small, what Merv and the rest of the team here at Wildwood have been able to accomplish over the past century on these 83 acres of land is remarkably different from the commonly accepted model of forestry all across the continent and one that we could all learn a great deal from. Let's start by looking at the health of this forest. Ecologically speaking, this place is freaking magical. Check out all this complexity. Everything from massive old growth Douglas firs with really complex crowns way up there on the canopy, to saplings in the understory, space in between all the trees with canopy gaps that allows light to come down so things can grow, and a rich medley of vegetation and mosses over an undulating expanse of pin mount topography. This sure looks a lot different from most of the second growth forests we see all over the continent. See, most commercial logging operates at large scale to maximize profits to shareholders above all other values, and as a result, whole forest ecosystems are often simplified through mismanagement and clear-cut tactics that reduce them to tightly packed, even-aged stands with second-growth trees with very little biodiversity or ecological complexity that makes them more susceptible to erosion, landslides, and climate-driven impacts like wildfire, drought, and disease. Here, things are done differently. More frequent, smaller scale harvests under a closed canopy that never removes more from the ecosystem than it can generate in a given period keeps the ecological function intact while still meeting demands for timber supply. Bigger, older, more fire resistant trees and wide space in between them means that these ecosystems are more resilient to disturbances like fire and the complex understory mitigates the flow of water and holds soil together to reduce drought, erosion, and landslides. This diversity of tree species at different ages and spacing allows for complex habitat to form whether as dens or burrows on the ground for critters like bears or martens to standing dead snags that provide home to insects and birds to intricate crowns way up in the canopy that host all sorts of epiphytes and even migratory and seafaring birds like 
marble murrelets, resulting in high biodiversity levels that allows for a wide breadth of life to survive and flourish here. The result is an intact functioning forest ecosystem with communities of different species working together despite it being actively harvested for human needs. We can see this community action happening right here before our very eyes. Check out this tree stump that was cut down a while ago. See how the cut has been sealed off with bark here? That's because this tree is still alive despite it being cut down. <laughs> what? How the cuss does it do that? Well, the answer here is through community. See. In a healthy, mature forest ecosystem like this one here, all these different trees, shrubs, and plants are all connected to one another through their roots by various mycorrhizal fungi, which create communities of different species that all share resources and nutrients with one another when they're in need. Energy in this system flows from sources of high energy to sinks of low energy. So when one tree is photosynthesizing really well and producing excess sugars, for example, those sugars will flow from its canopy down to its roots to the fungi who distribute that to all those in the community who might not be doing so well so they can all thrive. Trees like this one that got cut down was old enough to be really well connected to everything else here, acting as a really important hub or node for the fungi to transfer these nutrients. So when it was felled, it became an energy sink so that all these other trees here were able to send it the energy it needed to continue to grow layers of cambium, to seal off this wound, and to continue to live, even though it isn't able to photosynthesize or contribute to the rest of the forest in the same way. It's an incredible example of how interconnected these forest ecosystems have evolved to be with communities of different species helping one another out. But complexities like this are only able to exist amongst a healthy diversity of different species at different ages. When forest ecosystems are simplified through clear-cut logging, we lose that diversity of trees, species, and fungi in the soil that allows for everything here to thrive, resulting in lower productivity for the replanted forests that follow. This project shows that it is totally possible to manage our forests not just for timber, but other values while maintaining the ecological complexity that makes them so unique. Wow. So how is this all possible? Well, it's all about shifting our perspective on these forests from valuing them purely as a resource to instead consider all of the ecological, biological, social, cultural, and spiritual values they hold. For example, this big, massive, old growth Douglas fir tree behind me here would be highly prized in a myopic, shareholder-driven industrial logging operation that only focuses on the economics. But here, though this tree has an incredibly high economic value, it has an even higher ecological value for the role it plays here, and thus it remains standing as part of this forest ecosystem. In a similar manner, there are some really Really amazing 300 year old western red cedars just down that ravine that have some really high economic value but an even higher cultural value for the local indigenous communities so they remain standing. There's a standing dead snag right over there that has a moderately high economic value but an even higher biological value as habitat for all sorts of critters so it remains standing. Instead, trees in an overpopulated area or the ones that are being shaded out or maybe beginning to show signs of rot, disease, or decay or ones that fell over in a windstorm. Trees that have less value in all those other categories but still a reasonably high economic value are selected for harvest. By shifting the way we manage these forests to include values other than timber, we fundamentally change our relationship to them, allowing them to maintain their diversity and complexity for the overall benefit of each of us who have a stake in our collective future, not just those who have shares invested in some faceless resource extraction company focused on short-term economic gains. Ironically, by doing it this way, Wildwood has actually made more economic returns in the long term than had it all been clear cut and sold 80 years ago when the land was first acquired, all while maintaining the ecological complexity, social, cultural, and community values of an old growth forest. Places like this demonstrate the paradigm shift we need to reimagine our forest industry to create a better future for us all, and it all starts by valuing these forests as more than just an economic resource. As you can imagine, this perspective is radically different from our current industrial model. So what's it look like on the ground? See, modern logging practices often consider the economics of a forest harvest first and foremost, only considering ecological impacts when required to by loose sets of laws when it comes to riparian buffers or slope stability. Generally, a majority of these cut blocks are then laid out in an office somewhere using LIDAR and topography maps that highlight features they legally need to avoid and protect while maximizing the highest economical value of timber in the area. So relatively little on the ground knowledge of these lands goes into the harvest planning. As a result, these large-scale harvests drastically alter the landscape along with hydrology altering roads that are installed to allow easy access to clear-cutting as much timber as possible for as cheap as possible, with very little of the economic returns going back towards restoring the ecological function of these lands, resulting in heaps of problems with impacts that trickle down from erosion to sedimentation of streams and lower salmon returns, habitat destruction and loss of all sorts of biodiversity, landslides, droughts, floods, altered hydrological flows and regimes, increased 
increased risk to wildfire and fracturing of carbon sequestration and storage cycles at landscape level, just to name a few. However, here at Wildwood, harvested logs are selected based on their contributions to the ecological, social, and cultural values of the forest as a whole, and when they are selected for timber values, they're removed through closed canopy harvest via ATVs and machinery that requires less intricate and destructive road building. While over time these methods can compact soil and cause damage to the roots of some trees, when used as an alternative to clear cutting methods, it's clearly a far less impactful option. These logs are then taken to an on-site sawmill where they're milled locally before going to market, which is also a pretty different strategy than our current industry. See, most commercial logging operations use feller bunchers and technological advances to produce raw logs that are often milled elsewhere in massive sawmills ran by computers and machines that employ relatively few people, or even worse, they're sent overseas to be milled. Not only does this model irreparably modify the ecological function of these forests, but jobs are continually minimized every step along the way to increase shareholder value while weakening the communities that live amongst these forests. Here at Wildwood, trees are harvested by skilled fallers in more frequent intervals and selected based on their value to the ecosystem as a whole, with harvest never exceeding the annual rate of growth in the forest so that the ecological complexity remains intact. This requires intimate knowledge of these specific lands with ecologists, biologists, indigenous knowledge keepers, and forest managers all working together. Those logs are then pulled out one at a time in a closed canopy system where they are milled here on site and often sold within the local community to meet immediate demands, creating local jobs at every step along the way to strengthen the community that these forests depend on and vice versa. The result is a higher quality end product that keeps the ecological integrity of these forests intact while also strengthening our communities. It's a no-brainer. This type of management also hints at the bigger objective with Wildwood, which comes down to ownership. See, most woodlots these days are either managed by big timber corporations who own the license to log on public lands, or they own the land outright, privately, thanks to short-sighted and arrogant land sales that occurred with colonization and western expansion at the turn of the century, resulting in the privatization of large swaths of lands in the western United States. In both cases, loose sets of regulations make it really easy for these companies to go in, cut the whole forest down, make a buck and get out, without having to pay for any of the externalities or hidden costs that we incur as a society in the form of natural disasters or the ecological fallout of these landscapes. Ownership structures like that here at Wildwood or in other community forest projects are different in that they're managed directly by the people who live and rely on these lands and thus depend on their continued ecological function. As a result, different values of the forest are able to be considered over purely economic drivers, which results in engagement from a much wider range of shareholders. Indigenous stewardship dictates cultural and social values of these forests. Biologists and specialists monitor wildlife and hydrological regimes. Skilled followers work to selectively harvest the trees that it makes the most sense to harvest, and a network of other skilled workers help mill, process, and bring that timber to market. Not only does this create more jobs that contributes directly to the strength of the community, but it creates intact forest ecosystems that are managed for the long-term benefit to those who rely on them instead of the short-term economic gains for shareholders completely disconnected from these lands. It's all pretty innovative and inspiring, huh? Especially when looking at the status quo of logging across North America today, and it just makes sense. Decisions are made for and by communities for their long-term benefit, instead of by remote, wealthy, land-controlling elite who have no stake in the future of these lands or these communities. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Let's take a moment here to expand and get really creative, just like Merv did, to imagine what more is possible. Imagine for a moment having immediate access from the community you live in into a healthy, functioning forest ecosystem thriving with biodiversity that is managed for and by your community. Numerous studies have shown the mental health benefits of being immersed in nature and green spaces in addition to the spiritual connection one feels to being in the presence of various wildlife, so having more access to these quality spaces would do wonders to, for the mental health of our society at large. Imagine being able to take your family camping, easily, into a forest where restoration efforts have increased health and diversity and where the fees and associated costs go back into supporting the community who manages those forests for that richness. Diversity of species means more abundance and possibility for healthy trophic webs of predator and prey, of which we can participate in with more opportunities for responsible hunting and harvesting for local food security and community engagement. Then, imagine not just going for a leisurely walk through an old growth forest, but maybe a trail run, a mountain bike rip, or a ski shop through those forests. Heck, I've been biking, skiing, and running my entire life, and I don't know of a single place where you can do that through an old growth forest ecosystem. Imagine how incredible that would be. And these are communities and sports that thrive on people getting outside and being in forests, yet very few of them actually take place in healthy forest ecosystems. And with all of that comes tourism and tribal parks and opportunities for more community services and businesses to spring up 
to be supported, for communities to grow together. When we preserve and operate in a responsible manner within these ecosystems, we're not only preserving all of that biodiversity, ecological function, all the jobs, etc., but we're preserving opportunity. It gives us a chance now, and for those that follow us into the future, opportunity to do things differently, to expand on what we already know, to grow, to learn, and be connected to these lands in ways that we've just been too consumed with the economics to see. It gives us an opportunity for a different, better future. We just need to choose it. It is totally possible to create a truly sustainable model of forestry that doesn't jeopardize our futures. We just need to think differently and re-envision the way in which we operate on these lands to break up conglomerates operating at mass scale to instead encourage small scale local management by those who know these forests and have their best interests in mind. Not only can we keep the biological and ecological function of these ecosystems intact, but we can create more jobs, stability and opportunity within our communities and Wildwood demonstrates the feasibility of creating this new forestry model all across the continent that aims to grow a better future for all the shareholders and Involved, from me to you, our children, the communities we live in, and the lands we all live on. So instead of giving in the rhetoric of loggers versus environmentalists or jobs versus owls and all the divisive politics fueled by the established industry elite who are afraid of change because it threatens their bottom line, let's stop bickering and start working together. Let's start thinking differently to create a future that truly benefits all of us here today and the generations that will follow. Oh dang, what a beauty. If you're enjoying these videos, feel free to keep on watching, subscribe to my channel, or help support their production by becoming a patron at the Patreon page below. I've got all sorts of sweet perks there, as well as stickers and merch available at nerdyaboutnature.com. Because nature, it's pretty neat, you know? The more you know about it, the more fun you're going to have next time you're out there enjoying it. God, there's just so much green, you know? I've never seen this much green before.